Greetings, my name is Vincent and welcome. In this episode, let's try and paint five different chapters and put them on one base. Here, a Bunker 6. Of course we're going to need some Space Marines, so I'm just using some second-hand ones I picked up off eBay, and we're going to get straight to priming all of these in Vallejo Grey Primer. Now, because we're doing five different chapters, we need five different base coats, so let's get those on right now. I use an Eyewater Eclipse second-hand airbrush with an Eyewater Compressor at 30 PSI. Now, using an airbrush might seem like overkill, but I want to minimize how much paint I put on these tiny models, as I don't want to lose any of the detail. Let's start with my favourite of all the chapters, Imperial Fist. It's only my favourite because I've painted a lot of these, so I'm quite confident in the paint scheme that I use at this point. Now, I like to paint a lot of the details over the actual base coat rather than the layer colour, which is Uriel Yellow. It's mainly because I like to use the Uriel Yellow more as a highlight rather than a layer coat. The whole point of these tiny scale models is to really punch up the contrast as best as possible. So I like to start from a very dark layer and work up to a very light layer, even in the yellow department. Once I've established where all the details are being painted, I will then add the Euro Yellow right now to exactly the points where I need it, rather than having a sort of vague, dry brushed Euro Yellow layer over the entire piece. And of course, because this is a layer, we're trying to avoid recesses and just really focusing on articulating the high points of the model. I then realized I forgot to do the eye sockets, so we're just going to hit the initial base green color here in the eye sockets. Also, it's a good time to do it because if I can do cleanup at this point, now's a better time than later to do that. Now, I love this combination of paints, the Mephiston Red, but followed up with this Vallejo Air Red. It really makes a very vibrant blood red color. I love it very much. And as you can see from the finished outcome, it sort of adds this sort of shiny polished glaze to the Mephiston Red, and I think it works perfectly. Now we're just going to add a very subtle highlight to the lens areas with this moot green layer. Now I'm going to add a lens flare. Sadly, this shot was out of focus because the macro shooting of this video has been very, very difficult due to the size of the models. I need probably a better camera lens in order to stop this from happening. Now, normally when I do shades, I go with more of the brownie tones on larger models when it comes to Imperial Fist shading. But because of this size scale, I actually prefer using a more orangey tone, so that's why we're using Kastandara Yellow in this case. Now, just make sure that you're pulling all of this shade into the recesses and not leaving too much of it on the large flat surface areas because you don't want to stain those areas as those are going to be your areas for highlights. Now, normally the Euro Yellow would be the mid-tone, but I actually prefer the Avaland Sunset being the mid-tone. So we're treating the Euro Yellow as a highlight. That's why we're not covering the model entirely, because we can use the Avaland Sunset as a sort of a warmer tone that just sits underneath the Euro Yellow. So we've got a lower shade to work with. So all we have to do is get brighter from this point onwards. Now I'm just adding some flash highlights with Dawn Yellow, a very vibrant, very pale, almost egg white yellow. And as you can see, We've got a really nice contrasty model, considering this is only 6mm in scale. And to make the contrast even more emphatic, we are now going in with a brown recess wash in a couple of places, just to accentuate the different areas on the model. Now, I'm not doing this across every single recess, just where I feel it's necessary to create a more extreme contrast, as I still want some of the Cassandra yellow recess wash to cut through, so we've got a transition between the brown, orange, and yellow. Now you could go crazy with the metallics, but I decided to keep it very simple. I just made sure that there was black underneath most of the metallic areas, and I made sure that the area where I was painting metallic left a slight black outline to imply that there was a wash involved, even though there wasn't. Now, I haven't really painted many red things in my painting career, as it were, so I wasn't too sure on how I wanted to bump up the highlights. I obviously wanted to avoid making things too pink, which is an easy trap to fall into. So I did a mixture of the yellows that were already on my palette with a little bit of red, just to make sure that everything still felt kind of connected by using similar paints on my palette. And as always, with my very basic understanding of painting, the brighter I make something, the smaller the surface area it gets painted onto. So that's what we're doing here, which is adding more yellow and making sure that when we paint that back onto the model, the brighter it is, the smaller area it covers, and generally to a point. Once you've got the base coat down, we're going to immediately add the shade right over the top of it. 
Now, because this is such a small model, be very careful on how much of the shade that you put on your brush. Just pull the paint around the model and make sure it isn't pulling in too many areas too much because you don't want to lose any of that detail whatsoever. Now, because I'm a classic 90s Games Workshop hobbyist, I decided to follow the old school red bolter scheme for the Ultramarines rather than the more modern black bolter. And once again, we're using our same technique of Mephiston Red as the base coat, and then following it up with the Vallejo Red Air Paint to give you this really rich blood red color. Now, I did mention in the Imperial Fist model that I added a black layer before I put the metallic down. That's because the yellow is a much brighter tone, whereas with this dark blue, I think we can get away with just adding the metallic silver right over the blue without any additional layers of black. Now we're just going to do the eyes in a red and also make sure that if you make any mistakes, just go in and fix them immediately so you don't have to worry about it later when the layers become more complex. Although these models are so small, I would just recommend it's good training to fix all mistakes the moment they happen, no matter what the scale. Games Workshop seems to have updated their paint scheme for the Ultramarines recently, and the blue that they have mentioned for the layer at this point I don't actually own, so I decided to go with a Lytok blue instead, and it seems to do the job just fine. It's going to be getting covered with more base colors and highlights anyway, so it's not going to be too noticeable that it is a different color than what GW would normally recommend. Now with this additional blue highlight, we're just once again moving into smaller and smaller areas of the model, trying to create definition on edges and points. And with any model this scale, just take your time. Obviously there is a lot of mistakes that you can make very quickly. So just move in and out of the model very slowly, but very deliberately to get the best results you can. Now I'm kind of letting down my old school side a little bit here. If I was going to be truly old school, I would have kept the trim here yellow, but I decided to do the more modern gold trim instead. Now a very common trait I have in my life is to make it more complicated and that is what I decided to do here by making a very small checkerboard knee pad for no particular reason at all apart from to waste time apparently. Now obviously this is a step you don't need to take. Actually with all of the models that I'm showing you here there are much simpler ways of painting them. I just am showing you the way that I would paint them to pretty much the highest standard I would bother to paint anything at this scale. Alternatively, if you wanted to, all you'd need to do is base coat your model, add some wash, dry brush a highlight, dry brush a further highlight, further towards the top of the model, and then add your details and you're done. Now let's move on to the Dark Angels. And once again, after we've added our base coat, we're going straight in with our wash. And to give this model a bit more of a standout feature, I decided to give it a white helmet. But to get to that white, I'm using my regular towel scheme, which is starting with Orthwin Grey, adding a null oil shade, and then hitting it with some Ceramite White or any other alternative white you want to get your hands on. Now you will want to take your time with the Orthwin Grey because it does come out kind of chunky. You don't particularly want to lose too much of the detail, so just do probably about three or four layers very thinly and you'll get there in the end. Now we're just slapping on a bunch of null oil so we can really get into all the nooks and crannies. And as you can see, as we pull some of that away, we can get these lovely areas of definition that we're then going to add highlight to to further improve the contrast. Now, it might look like a gray mess to start with, but trust me, once you add those white highlights in, in the very specific raised areas, you'll really start to notice a difference. And if the Nuln Oil has done too much damage to your original Orthwin Grey base layer, you can always go back in with some Orthwin Grey, just on the raised areas, just to clean things up a little bit, then go in with your white as a final highlight. Now, as I'm recording this audio, I realized I should have probably done the shoulder pad trim in red, but I did manage to remember to do the bolter in the classic Dark Angel red. Sorry about that. Now I could have probably painted these to an even higher standard, but the way I had the camera set up meant that I had to kind of really fight my way around the camera and the model because the camera was right up in front of the lens. And that was a bit of a problem. So I'm sorry if the results aren't as perfect as they could have been. I will try and improve my camera setup somehow and see if we can get even better results for future models. Clearly I'm a glutton for punishment because I decided to give the Dark Angels a funky knee pad too. Now it is appropriate for a Dark Angel to have the sort of checkerboard knee pad. I've painted full size models with that in the past. So there we are. Once again, in hindsight, I realized I should have probably done a much quicker strategy, which is just paint a cross and then fill in the spaces. But for some reason, I didn't think to do that at the time. So pro tip, maybe paint a cross first and see if you can fill in those areas and get better results quicker than I did. 
The only thing I regret not doing with these particular models is adding a shade and a final highlight to the metallic areas, but I felt it was a bit overkill. But you could do that if you wanted. But speaking of things being overkill, I thought it would be a good idea, however, to do black outlines for the shoulder pads to separate the trim from the rest of the shoulder pad piece. This can be annoying, especially if you've already added highlights, so just take your time and make sure that you really focus on where that tip of the paintbrush is going as you're painting those black lines, because you can end up with very thick lines and you're going to need to do a lot of correction. Now I forgot to add the red glaze over the Mephiston base layer of the bolter, so I quickly did that and finished off with a bright orange highlight just running across the barrel of the bolter. Now I'm doing some very minor glazing here. I would recommend making the glaze a little dry on your brush than I had here, but you're just pulling the paint towards the area that you want to accentuate with brighter tones. And that's what we're doing here. We're just pulling the paint to the edges of things that I want to be brighter. Now I'm no expert in painting whatsoever, but from what I've learned recently with glazing, you're trying to create a gradient where you're tricking the eye into thinking two colours are blending into each other, rather than being two separate colours that are painted next to each other. And as you pull the paint, you're changing the opacity across that brush stroke, which allows you to create this fake sense of transition. Now, why are we doing all of this at all? With so many different layers and making things so complicated. Well, in my opinion, when you've got the models this small, trying to really boost that contrast is vitally important, whether the model is on the table or in your display cabinet. Now, this is my first attempt at painting a Blood Angel. I'm glad it was a small one. But we're going to be just doing our regular Mephiston red, then we're following up with some Agrax Earthshade to give us the shade that we require, let that dry off, and then we're going to start doing our initial layers and highlights, as we've been doing previously. Once you've removed any excessive amounts of wash from the model, you'll want to dry it quickly, and I recommend using a hairdryer. Just make sure the hairdryer isn't on a high setting, because you don't want to push any of the wash anywhere you don't want it to be. One secret weapon when it comes to Epic 40K is how brilliant it is for beginners, I've realized. If I had some Epic 40K to start painting with first before going in with some expensive Games Workshop 28mm scale models, I think I'd have been a much happier person. Because the great thing about models at this scale is it really forces you to focus in on your brush control, and you don't need to worry about making too many mistakes because these models are very easy to come by on eBay, and of course, why not just 3D print things at this scale if you don't want to waste a lot of resin? So there we are. Epic 40K is a wonderful way to start getting into the hobby without too much risk. Now there's one additional step that I didn't take with this model, and it's adding a further shade to really boost that mid-tone red and complement it. If you were to take on that step, I highly recommend using a ready brown like Rhinox Hide to bring that lower tone into the mix to really bring out the reds a little bit more. Due to the scale, you're going to hear me say this a lot in these painting videos, contrast, contrast, contrast. We're trying our hardest to create as much contrast on the model as possible, because it's going to look better for it. We're trying to keep the eye's attention, considering the model is so small, so we can only win that battle by creating a very visually articulate model. Now you can do whatever you want here. Sometimes I use Dark Reaper Blue, and then I use a lighter and lighter mix with white to create these black contrasts because I like a bluey black contrast rather than a gray black contrast. But in this case, I decided to actually go with my light gray combo instead. And as you can see, I'm just working my way into the edges and the corners to create that deliberate sheen. And we're just adding more and more whites to the smaller surface areas as we go. And you can see I'm using the side of my brush rather than the points just to reduce the opportunity for errors. Now I forgot to do my lenses earlier, so I'm doing them at quite a late stage and I prefer to do them a little bit early normally, but we're going to be doing the lenses in green. Now another side thought I had while recording the dialogue for this video is if you're new to this hobby and you want to have a Space Marine army but you're not sure which chapter to go with, this is a great way of figuring that out because 
Owning an army is very different from painting an army. You might like the Imperial Fists, but you might hate painting yellow. And the same can be said for Dark Angels or Blood Angels or Space Wolves. So if you want to learn how these paints work with each other, because all the paints do react slightly differently, it would be good to actually paint a model at this scale of a chapter that you desire prior to buying and investing in a large army before you know whether or not you're going to love or hate painting it. And the last model of the video is the Space Wolves chapter. Now obviously we're going through the regular steps here of putting a wash over our base coat, but actually the real issue came when I started adding the Fenrisian Grey layer. I really didn't like how different and how bright the Fenrisian Grey was compared to the darker tones of the Fang base colour and the shade. As you can see here, it's substantially brighter and the more layers I add, the way brighter it got. And I really didn't like how different the two contrasted from each other. Now, it may seem contradictory that I'm now complaining about contrast, but here's the rub. When it comes to the contrast, I still want the two colors or three colors to blend together realistically. Right now, there is too much of a jump between the base coat and the layer of Fenrisian gray. So what we're going to have to do is take a little quick pause, sometimes you have to do that, before moving any further and start digging yourself into big mistakes that you're going to have to change later on. So I thought, you know what, I'm going to take a pause on the layer of the rust grey, and I'm just going to paint the shoulder pads, going to do the yellow, going to do the reds now, and then we'll come back and see how we feel once we've got a few more colours on the model. And for the sake of time and simplicity, whenever we have a colour that we've already used, we're going to make sure that we follow the same process. So we're going to be doing the same process with all the reds and the yellows as we've done previously. Now, although I tout myself as an Epic 40k channel, this is the first time I've actually painted properly some Space Marine infantry. And what I'll say after going through this is I would recommend painting each one individually when it's not attached to a base. It makes it much easier to get around the sides of the model, which may not seem important, but just being able to get around this model quickly and easily is going to be much easier than having to deal with and negotiate with other models stuck right next to it. Another point to consider is you want to be able to get your paintbrush into all these tiny little places and having other things around the model are just going to make this more harder than it needs to be. So I recommend getting a piece of Plasdrug tubing like I've done here, add a bit of white tack and then just stick the model on top. It holds quite nicely if you're not painting too aggressively onto the model, which you probably shouldn't be doing anyway. Now I still wasn't happy with my rust grey layer, but I thought why not just add some more highlights and then we can see where we go from there. So that's what we've done. We've added some highlights in all the areas that I thought were necessary and we're going to start blending the layers together just to make them feel a little less extreme in their contrast department. Now if you're new to glazing, these shoulder pad areas are really great areas to practice with because you can kind of push the paint right up to the trim and it just kind of sits there nicely. And you can really see the results quite quickly. And there you go. You get your glazing going, and then you can expand that to a larger surface area on a large model when you're confident enough to do so. Now another way of making the model look really sharp and tidy is adding some black line work, which is what we're going to be doing on the shoulder pad areas here. Now some of the mistakes are made, but are resolved in an off-camera quick fix, where I just paint in the layer colours again that have been painted over by the black line work. And if you're curious, I'm using a size 0 Da Vinci paintbrush. These are really nice. Windsor Newton will do the same job too. Now I still wasn't happy with the Fenrisian grey layer, but I decided to go ahead and just start painting the rust grey highlight to see if that fixed my problems, and it kind of did. And that's done by the fact that this very bright rust grey highlight is taking the eye to the corners and edges and highest surfaces of the model, so you're not so transfixed on what's happening in the darker crevices of the model, which is kind of what you want to happen across the board on most models, where something is dark is generally meant to not have as much attention paid to it. And now we have the Fang, Fenrisian Grey and Rust Grey competing with each other. There is less attention paid to my issue with Fenrisian Grey. It's now the mid-tone as it should have always been, rather than the main point of focus, which of course we never wanted it to be. Now we're not really doing any glazing here, we're just kind of dabbing the paint where we want it. And because the model's so small, these very bright colours placed in very specific areas seem to do the same job as glazing in many respects anyway. And when some of the blends weren't working and they seemed too divided, I just mixed up a combination of Rust Grey and Fenrisian Grey and placed it where I thought the transition should be made smoother. 
And as the graphic just said, we're now focusing on cleanup. These black lines really make a difference and really help create a nice solid model to look at. The eye knows where everything should be, the colors are organized, and almost given an illustrative quality to them with the black line work. Now, of course, as you've noticed, there hasn't been any particular rhyme or reason or order to how I've done these models, and I apologize for that. I will try to be more organized in the future with my planning. But as you can see, we just added the metallic silver on at this point, and this model is practically finished. Finally, I did some off-camera TLC to lead us to this point here in the presentation. In conclusion, this was a lot of fun, although it was slightly time consuming because of course each chapter requires its own paint scheme, which means that they all need their own paints out, or their own washes, or their own highlights, and so on. The only thing that was consistent was the metallic silver throughout. Hopefully after seeing this video, I've helped you decide which chapter you may want to work with if you're new to this hobby and want to start a Space Marine Army of your own. If you made it this far through the video, thank you so much for watching the five different chapters all on one tiny base. I hope perhaps you learned something new, and if you didn't, at least enjoy the video. So, if you're new here, please consider subscribing to the channel, and if you enjoyed the video, please consider giving it a thumbs up, and maybe check out some of my other videos. We've got plenty more models to paint if you've seen my previous collection videos. But until next time, I've been Vincent, signing off from here at Bunker 6.